Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Sorry, that I was talking about surprise there. I was trying to think of a joke for agency affairs. There's no affairs in our agency. No, so I've got to be doing that. But we should move over to that sofa. Uh, so the reason we've got the mic set up as well is because we are going to create a podcast from this as well. In fact, last week was our inaugural testing of this. So we're not sure whether it's worked or not, but we'll soon find out, I'm sure. Yeah, so um, if you are new to this, this is a 10 to we are too. 15 minute uh, loose woman styled show. Uh, loose agents, that's what we should call it. <laughs> where uh, we talk about any news that's come up in the last week, uh, give our opinions, we'll give your opinions, um, and yeah, talk about the news and what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. So I've, um, I've got Phil to bl- a blind react to some of these. One piece of news I have is I'm going to watch McFly tonight. One piece of news I have is I'm going to hit Norway tomorrow. One nil to Phil. <laughs> you know you've completely ruined your street cred. Don't have any. Okay, so this is the first story about housing stock. This was from Property Industry Hour yesterday, I think. Uh, housing stock has dropped significantly since the beginning of this year, driven in large part by high demand from buyers. Uh, there's a bit about the stamp duty holiday, which we don't take any notice of, but it's also talking about mortgage uh, advances in the second quarter of this year being at the highest level since 2007. Bit of a surprise there, is it? No, I don't think so. Do you think there's going to be, well, you're too to uh, comment on this really, but thinking about what the, how... Ages. The, <laughs> how the mortgage lending criteria, I mean, it's a lot tighter now. Well, we were having a conversation a few weeks ago about how you used to just tell the mortgage company what you earned <laughs> and then <laughs> signed it off. We should be a bit too, shocked about it, weren't you? Bit, yeah, yeah, I wish I could do that now. Do you know what? When I first ever got my first mortgage, you had to have an interview in person with either the bank manager or the mortgage lender. It, you, you couldn't just get one over the phone or online or whatever. You had to go in and have to speak to them so they could assess your character. Your character? Yeah, you, literally your character. And then it went completely the opposite direction to self-certification mortgages. Do you remember those? When they did were they great. start? But that led to a boom. That's, that was partly what caused the problem. Yeah. So that probably started in about 2004, right. where you could just make it up. You didn't have to have any proof. In fact, wage slips in those days were non-automated wage slips, so they were just handwritten on pieces of paper, so you could just make up a few wage slips. Not that I ever did that. But, but but towards 2006, 2007, uh, people were starting to be called out on it and uh, some people went to prison for mortgage fraud and that, that started being reported on uh, That's Life and Watchdog and all those kind of consumer affair programmes and then things started to change. And then the bottom fell out of the financial world. So um, Michael Gove has been promoted to Housing Secretary and he's going to, he said that we need to prepare ourselves for some potential changes. So what could those be, do you think? Um, well, just a, a side comment. One of our clients' sons is very high, is one of the um, ministers, the defence minister, in fact. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, you, you didn't come, but interesting. Mm. So he has a very interesting job. And his... his um, uh, constituency is up for debate because they're going to move them all around, aren't they? I think Barons is up for debate as well. Up for Not him, surely. Well, well, he'll still be able to run, but they're going to make him much bigger, I think. So. Our uh, MP is Tim Farron, which is why I don't vote. Can't vote for him, can't vote against him. He has a monopoly around here, but he's actually a nice guy, which is why you can't vote against him. Yeah. Um, what was go? So what do you think he's going to bring in? Do you think he's going to bring in some kind of regulation, some kind of licensing, uh, like they have in the states? So in the states, if they if somebody wants to sell their own home, they've got to actually get a real estate license to sell their own home. You have to have a real estate professional to sell a home. With a license. I think something is going to come. It's just, it's just how they how they do it. I saw Perry talking about it, saying that he thinks everyone should be regulated. And I guess there should be something. I'm just not sure what that is because just because you've passed an exam it doesn't mean you're any better or any worse than someone that hasn't passed that particular exam. Um, I, I guess it'll, it'll give you some kind of base knowledge. Yeah, but, but base knowledge in what? You know, flying freeholds, what does that help? Mm. The, the challenge I have with it is how do you actually teach somebody to value a home correctly when actually none of us really know? 
you know, apart from things like precedent and price per square foot, well, that's fine. Once we've got those in the bag, then what? The, the, the only thing I hope he doesn't do is go to the Scottish system of um, valuation by, by someone else. Yeah, and then that, yeah. and then it's almost a flat figure and... It's not, it's not a market forces then. No. Imagine if you've got surveyors involved in our... I mean, they're already too involved as they surveyors are. Surveyors have too much power as it is. Yeah. So I hope he doesn't go down that route. Um, We've had an undervalued. But it's Gove. Gove. Gove loves getting his fingers in in things um, that he probably shouldn't. So he's, he's bound to do That's something. Gimp, isn't he, really? That's what you think. I don't like the fact that something looks like that could be in charge of <laughs> housing. It looks it's like a, uh, a caricature. He does. He looks like Tintin that's growing up too much. Yeah. Um, yeah. He likes he likes to to do controversial things as go. So I'm sure he'll do something. Um, yeah, I guess it's easy for us to say because we um, like to think we know what we're doing and we do things correctly and do things morally, but there are people out there that don't and supposedly someone's brought in to protect. You can't that. protect somebody from lack of from no, information from lack of morals. No, they can't. no matter what you do. And yeah. that's actually it's the biggest problem in the industry. Past, so what's the point? Exactly. But, um, are you honest? But yes. Then, tick. I think that they've tried to regulate the industry in, in a ridiculous way with the TPO, with the I mean, the AML's embarrassing. What's the point in the AML? What do, we, what do you pay for? They charge us money. It's only £100 a year or something like that. But what, what are we paying for? And then we yeah, have to put all this information that, that all what? we do is put into this database that people far cleverer than us can, could get around, I'm sure. If someone wanted to, um, to money launder, the more intelligent than our systems that cost a pound per, per search. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like they put a lot of responsibility on us in certain sections and then, and in, dis and then us. totally don't care about the industry in others. <laughs> so it'd be nice to, to kind of level it out, I think. Uh, there's no right or wrong here, is, is there really? There's no easy answer. Uh, the other, uh, another story from uh, Property Industry Eye says property sellers made an average gain of 110,000 over the last year. When they said property sellers made an average gain, if the average price property in the UK is 330,000 roughly, yeah, how can they have made 110? Something's got the maths wrong. Property sellers made average gains of more than 110,000. We're saying properties have gone up in value by 33% well, in the last year. Well, it then says according to the latest research from Savile, so maybe it's only Savile properties. That would possibly have to be. So do you think an average Savile property is 800 to a million, and therefore it's 10% of it? Yeah, it's 10%, that's, that's mm -hmm. got to be it. Significantly profited. If the UK is going up by 110 grand, we've got problems. Uh, asking prices hit records high as buyer demand peaks up. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, saw, uh, I spoke to you about a house in Sandbanks. I think it sold for ten point something million. Harry Redknapp's old house it was amazing. But I thought a house like that in Sandbanks would go for more than ten million. Yeah, but it's not that much money, is it? No, no. And it actually is very expensive real estate in terms of. It was the first place in the UK to go over a thousand pounds square um, foot. What, what is it at the moment then? How, how many square feet was it? Uh, it looked maybe 6,000 square foot, but they had a, a additional accommodation as well. So and and yeah, frontage. frontage? And beach frontage. Beach frontage, jetty. Probably 6,000 square foot. I don't know. Are we losing touch with reality? That 10 million doesn't sound a lot? Me personally. Well, you, don't you? No, no, no. I, obviously, it's a lot of money, but. Um, I think it's, I was waving at us because we're not. But we have, we have someone around the corner to sort of 75 million. Um, not house, business. Um, so, <laughs> we house then. <laughs> on a 2% fee. I thought, um, I thought you'd got the best one point in the one place. No, so 75 million. So, he must be one of, I know it's not overly common, we then, we've met two or three in the last month that have, have got that sort of money. Yeah, one guy is so sold for 75 million. So, and you'd say sandbank, 6,000 square foot, beach fund, probably one of the most sought after houses in, mm -hmm. in the country. So, so therefore, 10 million doesn't seem that much money in that sense. No. Because how many people have 10 million pounds? Quite a lot. Don't they? I suppose, yeah. Well, we know a few. It's a two bed terrace in the centre of London. <laughs> yeah, um, I read this wrong. This is uh, from, this is about strike, no fee the strike agent. Around. They used to be how simple. Uh, no fee agent strikes, strikes, uh, very clever that I say today. 
the five billion sales, um, five billion pound sales. I'm like, I misread it and I read it as the, the pitch of a five million pound property. So I'll probably ignore that story. Well, no. No free agent checks, five billion sales on that. So they've sold property worth five billion. Yeah. Right. I'd say. Don't know. It's, well, you can't really say it's impressive or not. It depends how, how long they've been going. A very long time. Is that guy who was doing 99 pounds still going? The young lad who, who set it up in six form? I don't know. What was his name? Someone else has it. Someone will, yeah. Uh, and also, I want to know if anybody knows what Jamie Lester's up to these days as well. Who's he? He's the he's one of the original apprentices that started up an estate agency. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. The apprentice, as in Alan Sugar. Yeah, yeah. I think he came second. And actually, Alan Sugar said Sir Alan said he was one of the nicest guys he'd ever met. Lord Alan. No, Lord Sugar. Sir Alan, Lord Sugar. Got to get it right. What? Yeah, it's got to be Sir Alan or Lord Sugar. You don't say Sir Sugar or Lord Allen. See, it's just etiquette, girl. It's just basic etiquette. I'm not sure. I went to the right that. schools. Um, so, two more stories. These are a bit more fun. I, we met someone off the apprentice a few weeks ago, didn't we? Did I? We were there. You might have gone to bed. They're expert empires. Oh. Loved herself. They always do. It's coming back round again, isn't it? I mean, I loved her as well, but... Did you? I bet you did. If I'm around... When Phil's trying to chat up ladies, I always say, this is my son-in-law, he's married to my daughter. How often do I try and chat up ladies while you're around? It has happened once. But you won't do it again, will you? It hasn't happened once bed. at all. So this is about TikTok. It offers a potentially good opportunity for agents to reach younger audiences, including a number of prospective buyers and renters, says Property Mark. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> I think... What do you think, Property Phil? Um... That'd be a rough name, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I I don't think TikTok will ever have a place in mid to high end property sales. I don't think it has a place in low end property sales. But I do think it has a, a place in in low end and definitely rentals. I think it has a place in personal brand building. Yeah, as a and then product. everything else is a by product of that. Yeah. It's certainly not if you if you just open your agency and you're trying to build uh, your business and presence and, and get listings. It's something not to spend time on. Don't, don't start there. In fact, it's probably like the tenth thing you should do, and most people don't get past the three. So yeah, even we haven't really. Um, and then lastly, we have had this conversation before actually about the great suit debate, and um, we have lots of conversations about it. In fact, what were the answers on that? So it today, there's only one share. You know, article. Obviously. Um, what does the property industry think about suits? Mm-hmm. I don't know why the uh, hashtag suit debate in property state agent today national trade. It looks it's like it's it's a, a post on a different platform. Well, it's not, it's from Hootsuite. So yeah. yeah. Um, I think there's only one answer here actually, and it's no, probably quite answers. a boring answer that just wear what you think feels right for the job you do. And for the people that you're trying and to attract. Big, yeah, for the people trying to attract. I always say, look like them on a good day. Because so there, are, there are people, some of our clients, that um, are firework members that wear suits and feel good wearing suits, mm-hmm. and that's what makes them mm-hmm. perform at their best, and therefore they shouldn't change and all of a sudden wear something else. However, just as a, as a counterpoint to that, if they are not getting into the houses they want to get into, they could look at the, the retire to decide whether that's something they could change. Because if, if you're a lady of a certain age, mm-hmm. as some of us are, and you are wearing a suit and you're not getting into the high value homes, or if you are, you're then not getting the conversion, I would look at your attire because your attire is really, really important. And I don't think a suit is appropriate for a high value home. And that's for uh, ladies and gents. So if you look like them on a good day, what does that mean? You know, when they're going out for a coffee date or something where they're going out and doing something nice with a friend socially, what would they wear then? So it's not too formal. It's not too uh, bright, colourful, exuberant. It's something that is, well, smart casual is an awful term, but that's actually what we're talking about. Phil goes like he is. But yeah, show them your shoes. What are they called? Mm. Trainers? Um. Show them. What make is it? 
Uh, they're actually a make that, because um, I buy way too many shoes, I have ridiculous amount of shoes, um, and this is a make that is zero, net zero. Carbon dropping. Yeah, so I, I can't even pronounce it. But it's kind of expensive. I feel like I wear two expensive shoes to go. Two, not three. Two is in T O O, two O's. Um, then people think, you know, it's a bit weird. Well, you could actually go. It's unnecessary. The next step of this is the car debate, really, isn't it? Because we've had this conversation a lot of times. Because uh, you said the other day to somebody that you would like to get a Porsche, but then you don't even have clients would like. No, that. I think I'll get over KN, the big one. I don't think I'll get over the nine eleven, mm. which I wouldn't really want nine eleven, but. Um, yeah. We need to move these so we can lie back rather than us having to. We do. But back to back to suits. <laughs> um, I can't see what I can do. It's all gut feeling, and it is on on opi your opinion as well. Like, there's no real evidence to say um, it's a defining factor. Like if everything, because here's the reason why, nothing is ever equal across all the parts. Yeah. So you could say if every single thing is equal, then dress sense may come into it. Or you, what you're wearing comes into yeah, it. Yeah, but, but it's very difficult. No, because if you, I wouldn't agree with that. Because if you're Karen Brady mm -hmm. and you go in, you can get away with the suit because you've got the gravitas, you've got the experience, you've got the confidence. But she would get away with because she with them because she got the name. Yeah. So, so all things are never equal. So the three A's that I talk about for triple A team, do you know what they are? Triple A team. Mm -hmm. That that Snickers guy. What? Attitude. Is he not a triple A? Is that not? No. I don't know who it is. Attitude. What's A? No. <laughs> shut up. The A team, that's what I mean. <laughs> Got way before your time. <laughs> yeah. What's all I know about this Snickers advert? The A team. <laughs> Better do a Snickers advert. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, anyways, attitude, aptitude, appearance, those three things. And those three things together cover everything, really. So your attitude when you walk through the door, your confidence, everything. So that can overcome a bad, bad clothes, can't it? But appearance, you will be judged on straight away. And the, uh, your aptitude is your, you know, can you deliver successfully? Can you talk to them about things in their house that they need to change? Can you demonstrate skills and experience? Can you demonstrate sensitivity? And you, all those things are really, really important. So if one of them is low, like your dress sense is, you know, a little bit scruffy or it's overly formal, then the other two things have to work harder to overcome that. So you're better off giving yourself the easiest possible chance mm. with dressing like them on a good day. And then that's, that's like ticking that box. And then all you have to do is attitude and attitude. Uh, as, um, I was watching a programme the other day and I was thinking about how this person, particular person, um, said hi to people and it was very engaging. It was um, Gordon Ramsay and he was very, not aggressive, but very um, exuberant. Very, what's the word? Very firm in the way he did it. He, he, he didn't put, he just put his hand out and wait. He almost stepped into their space and was talking at the same time. It, and it, it was um, authoritative, but it was also uh, warm and, and welcoming as well. And uh, it made me think about how, how I do it. And I probably put my hand out and wait, and it's a bit more passive, isn't it? Mm. Rather than he was like, so into, yeah. But quite think about the best, best politicians. So people like, uh, whatever your political bias is, forget that, David Cameron and... Tony Blair and uh, Bill Clinton, those three are probably some of the most charismatic leaders we've had in the last 30 years. And if you think about how they are... Johnson's quite charismatic. Oh, no, no, Johnson. Well, I really like Johnson back then. That would polarise people too much, wouldn't it? But yeah, you can imagine he would just be a little bit, maybe, like, noddy. Wouldn't he? A bit exuberant, like a little puppy. But the other three, I think, are a bit more, <laughs> a bit more like you just said, like Gordon Ramsay, mm. where they're a bit more um, yeah, assertive and energetic. But it's, all, it's very char charismatic. So I think that if you're charismatic, if you have a natural charisma, and don't rely on your own judgment for this, then you can wear what you like, because it doesn't really matter. So Gordon Ramsay, you probably wouldn't even notice what he was wearing, because he's got his charisma. Richard Branson, probably another one. But if you haven't got the charisma, then your clothes are going to have to do some of the work for you. So therefore, you're clothes need to make the right statement. It took us about four years to persuade Mr. George Verdis of London Executive uh, in Marleybone to stop wearing a tie. And it was a real big thing for him, actually. He still wears a very nice suit and a very crisp shirt with proper cufflinks. Crisp shirt. Very crisp shirt is. And I'm sure he feels a little bit naked without his tie. But I think it was a positive thing for him. I think a tie can um, 
bring you down a level below that of the client that's in front of you? Yeah, I certainly think it's something worth thinking about, how you dress. But then would you expect a bank manager to wear a tie? You wouldn't expect to go into a bank branch, would you, and not be wearing a tie? Although they're actually they're all in uniform now, aren't they? I can't last time I saw a bank manager. Are you in uniform? I can't go into a bank. I don't have enough money to go into a bank. <laughs> don't need a bank, do you? <laughs> Isaac's pushing for a pay rise. <laughs> and that's news. <laughs> that's the news, yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the latest news. <laughs> Isaac pushes for what? That's a very easy answer. <laughs> that's the easiest answer to the whole show. <laughs> Next week, Isaac has left. <laughs> It's been fired. So in the next uh, the next two weeks, I'm not going to be here. Are you going to carry on with this? I might invite someone to debate on here with. <laughs> you can move on. Not sure. He'll be on my team. No, you have to have someone who's not on your team. Actually, I'll just say this because I know I just have to go, but I had a very interesting conversation with George yesterday, and you won't mind me sharing this, about, and with you as well, I had the same conversation about um, the disc profiling, which we won't go into, but... Basically, depending on your disc profile is how you react to other people. And the it's D-I-S-C, so the D and the C is task orientated and the I and the S are people orientated. And Phil is a very high D, which is dominant and determined, and all the D words actually, and so am I. But he also, like he also has a <laughs> he also has a high I and I don't have a high I. And the difference between us, and George does as well have a very high I, the difference between us is Phil and George like other people to agree with them, and I don't. They actually must agree with me. Yeah, so I said to George, right, imagine you're in a battle, let's play, let's play it out. Imagine you're in a battle, and they say, um, or even after the battle, and they say, thank you so much for the £4 million valuation you gave me on my house. I've actually decided to go to Purple Bricks because I'm an expert marketer and I think I can do a good job. What's the next thing you say? And he spent minutes trying to talk them out of it. I go, do you know what? I, I wouldn't talk them out of it. I, I get the competition you know, element of it, but I'm actually just really interested in what makes somebody you know, go that route and pick that decision and tell me about it. But I don't want to try and change their mind. I just want to just listen to them. Same if they're of different persuasion uh, politically, because I said this to him and I said, what religion are you? And he's Greek Orthodox, which I didn't even know. So I said, okay, well, imagine if you're... So it was French. That's <laughs> French. French Orthodox. So I said, uh, imagine if you're talking to somebody from the Amish population. He hasn't heard of that. But anyway, if he has, and I explained that they don't use technology or, um, or any kind of mechanics, what would you do then? He goes, uh, great, you've given me the opportunity to get ahead of them. I said, well, would you try and persuade them to like drive a car and have an iPhone? But he said, no, he wouldn't. So there are some circumstances he wouldn't try and change them to his, his viewpoint. I mean, I, I'm vegetarian, but I don't try and change anybody's mind. But you're a meat eater and you do. Yeah, but, but there is a line somewhere because if I met someone that wasn't a Carlisle fan, I'm not going to try and convince them to be a Carlisle fan. Oh, you've got no chance. You have to be able to have a chance of winning in both senses of the word. Mm. How about if somebody said to you, the sprayer passed it? Well, it should be dead to me, so <laughs> it's of no consequence. So you had a conversation with my daughter in my kitchen the other day about uh, sexism and racism, remember? I don't know why you set yourself up for it, I really don't. Yeah. Would you not be prepared just to listen to her point of view and then not comment? <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not an opinion, hers isn't an opinion based on any kind of <laughs> intellect or fact, so no. However, I've got um, some... Well, hang on, hang on, look, hang on. You believe in God. Let's bring some intellect and fact into that. <laughs> no, no, no. Um... And that's this week. No, 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 way. no. You're not... Um, you're, you're trying to define what God is to, is to me. Well, there's no fact in it. You've but got... you're trying to define it. You're thinking... That you're imagining what I think it, it is. Uh, uh, do you feel like you've had proof that there is a God? Do I need... No, no, do you feel like you have had proof that there is a God? Mm. Or that you do have proof that there is a God? And I'm not going to argue with you, no, so no. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> well, it's, it's... Is your, your definition of my belief um, is incorrect? I think that your belief... I believe your belief isn't based on intellect or fact. I be, but... but but, but the belief, yeah, no, I agree, but you're misinterpreting the reason why. Reason why what? The, the reason why um, 
why I choose to think there is something else. Yeah, but you choose to think. Yeah, but, but, I, but, I, but, but I, I wouldn't argue on it. But Tess chooses to believe something that's not based on intellect. But she fact. would argue on it. <laughs> why do you do? Does that make sense? Yeah. And do you know what? When we were in, just to change the subject a bit away from God because it's probably a bit inflammatory, we were I'm down at seriously fun business the other day and watching Matt in action. Mm. And he said, when you're in a valuation plan, didn't use those words, when you're in sales um, consultation, and you, you're you repeating back to them or you're summarising or you're, you know, you're um, making sure you've got the main points, don't change their words because it sounds like you're correcting them. So don't make it sound worse or better than they said. And you can do that by repeating their words back to them. And it's the same kind of thing. Otherwise, you're trying to change their opinion to your opinion. You're actually trying to manipulate them. But actually, by asking them the right questions, they will come to their own decision. And therefore, that will be a stronger decision than the decision that you could have forced upon them. What do you think? I agree. I, I totally agree. And the last time we didn't agree, you tried to change your mind. What was it? I can't remember. But I've never understood this logic that I've always, since I was a child, people always said, you always think you're right. Well, if I walked around thinking I was wrong all the time, you've got problems. Yeah, but you could walk around thinking that you may be right, you may be wrong, but you're going to try and find out. It's much easier just to think you're right. <laughs> isn't it? Well, it takes less time. Yeah. Right, and if that. at any point I find out I'm wrong, I'll change my mind and then I'm still right. They'll just change my mind. So. <laughs> right, well, I think we will leave it there because we went off on a big time. I can't, yeah, I can't remember what the point of that was. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was a suit. The suit, yeah. The suit debate. This one here from the agency today. Uh, so, yeah, Phil's going to try and strong arm somebody to come and argue with him on the social, so that'd be interesting to see. <laughs> If anybody from the group wants to join in. And if anyone wants to, from the group, we could always scream out. I do enjoy it. My you, wife hates it. You enjoy being right. She absolutely hates it. But, you, know. you get very militant. I, I, I also do enjoy people challenging my opinions. Only if they're wrong. Only if, if they're wrong? Yeah. No, no, no. Only if they're proved to be wrong and you're proved to be right. Well, you, well a lot of things you can't prove. <laughs> well, the existence of God. And you can't prove... There's, there's no fact behind... Racism, sexism, that's, there's a, there's a huge grey area of opinion. Agreed. So, same thing. And on that note, we really are going to wrap up. So next week, on the week after, I won't be here. But should we just quickly mention the Ed webinar on Thursday, the 30th of September. It's a week today. Mm -hmm. Thursday, week today, yeah. 11 o'clock in the morning, but not for me. It's 12 o'clock in the afternoon because I will be in Svalbard. And I will prove to you that I'm in Svalbard by showing you on my webcam. As long as it's um, nice, a nice view. Because <laughs> you may not, if it's not. But yeah, so that's where I'll be coming to you from. It's the only work I'm going to do while I'm away. I'm going to come to you for this webinar. And the webinar is about 3Xing your valuations in the next three months. Because the two problems we can see at the moment that we think most of you have is low stock and really downward pressure on fees. We've had the first pressure on fees in the last few weeks since we opened. Mm. Yeah. So we're going to address that and in this webinar. The third one is the challenge of, of uh, which will then lead to cash flow challenges in six months' time. Yeah. When you've spent all your summer earnings. And you've bought a boat. Mm. Okay. Bye, guys. Nice to see you on here. And we'll just keep waffling until Isaac comes over and turns it off because he's probably forgotten. And uh, then he's rushing. I have two recordings. To the dental. <laughs>